So one of my favorite sports movies is the 2008 film Forever Strong, which tells the story of a high school rugby player in Utah named Rick Penning. And Rick is sentenced to a boys' juvenile detention center in Salt Lake City after being the cause of a drunk driving accident. Now, the manager of the detention center happens to be one of the alumni of a local rugby team called Highland, the Highland Rugby Team. And he decides to put Rick on the team coached by Larry Gelwix. Now, prior to this, Rick had played for his very transactional father's team. But Rick's experience of playing for the legendary Larry Gelwix was vastly different. And one of those things was the consistent one-on-one conversations that he would have with players in a lawn chair on the sidelines of the rugby pitch. I want to share a clip from the film of an early conversation between Rick and Larry Gelwix that gives some great insight into what those conversations were like. Rick, I want to ask you to be a captain. I did. Q's already captain. And we always have at least two. But he can't stand me. The same with half the guys this out there. It's not about them. It's about you. It's about being the best Rick. Well, what about Tumo? He and three or four other guys came to me suggesting you. The team doesn't get this kind of stuff alone. I don't get it. You know exactly why I'm here and you still act like you care. I'm just a... No good spy who cheap-shotted your star player last year. First of all, I attribute that cheap shot to your coach, not you. And second, let's focus on where you could end up, not where you were or are. And God doesn't make a no good anything. You just got to learn to listen and pay attention to that spirit inside you. Learning to listen... That takes a lot of discipline. So I love that clip from the film because it shows what I believe is the most important thing that transformational coaches do consistently. One-on-one conversations with their players where they're asking questions, listening, and affirming the individual. Now, Gelwix, who's played by Gary Cole in the film, doesn't just tell Rick he believes in him, but he lets him know his team believes in him and he values him as a person regardless of his you know, previous transgressions. So we are excited to have the real Larry Gelwix on the podcast today, who is known as the winningest coach in America. I mean, from 1976 to 2012, his teams compiled 419 wins and only 10 losses, including 20 USA Rugby National Championships in the 26 years that the USA Rugby has sponsored a national championship. They also, in 1998, won a bronze medal in the World Schools Rugby Championship. But more importantly than all that success, uh, to his players and to his community, Gelwix is known as a transformational coach, one who has changed the lives of thousands of athletes during his time as the coach. Now, in the first part of our conversation with Larry, we're gonna talk a little bit about the movie, But more importantly, we're going to dive into how he measures success and what the culture of Highland Rugby was about and how it operated. Thank you for listening into the Coaching Culture Podcast. If this is your first time listening, my name is J.P. Nurbin, and I'm joined every week by my friend and co-host, Nate Sanderson. If you are a frequent listener, welcome back. By the way, after today's episode, if you want our notes, You can head on over to thriveonchallenge.com to subscribe to our weekly newsletter. Also, you can learn more about Thrive On Challenge, our community and mentorship program, which supports coaches on the journey to build a better culture and become transformational leaders. Now let's jump right into our conversation with Larry Gelwix. One of the first things I actually want to start by asking you is a little bit about the fact that you were in a movie. I think many coaches have different dreams and aspirations when it comes to winning championships and all that. But few of us ever would probably even think of being uh, portrayed in a movie. So what was that experience like? The story behind Forever Strong, and I'll be brief on it, is really quite interesting. I got a call one day from a movie studio, and they had been in, well, in New Zealand, 
for six months doing a film. And they fell in love with the game of rugby, which, of course, is the game that's played in heaven. And we all want to go to heaven. <laughs> well, why are you laughing? It's a true statement, JP. <laughs> anyway, they called me up and said, you know, we would like to make a movie about your life and coaching career. I'm thinking, who is this really? Uh, is this uh, candid camera? Well, I could see it was an out of uh, a state number. And they convinced me they were a legitimate uh, studio. And uh, they explained it. And they said, can we come to Salt Lake and uh, talk to you about this? I said, sure, it's your dime. So they came to Salt Lake City, where I live now. And uh, it said we'd been in New Zealand. We fell in love with the game of rugby. And being an American studio, they wanted an American story. And I said, well, how did you get my name? And they said, well, everywhere we asked about American rugby overseas and in the U.S., your name came up. And, uh, and uh, so they started talking. They had storyboards and they brought binders of information. It was really kind of interesting. And they proposed a movie. And, you know, all false modesty aside, uh, 418 wins and just 10 losses, including 20 national championships in 36 years, uh, caught their attention. And uh, they proposed a movie about that. You know, they, they were saying, you know, we got movies on football, baseball, ice hockey, basketball, wrestling, everything. But no one had ever made a movie about rugby, the second most popular sport in the world, right after soccer. And um, they wanted to do one. And I'll tell you kind of an insider secret there is uh, we'd had a lot of talks. They stayed, it was a four hour meeting and they proposed this movie. And they said, you know, you'll have to sign a release. And the executive producer said, uh, it was on a Friday, it was our last meeting. We had several meetings and they said, uh, I'll call you Monday. Think about it over the weekend. And I thought about it. Now, that was a great idea. I mean, I mean, come on. How many funerals do you go where the, somebody, the pastor stands up at the pulpit and says they made a movie about this guy, you know? So Brad calls the executive producer, and he always called me coach. He says, coach, what do you think of the idea of making a movie? And I said, I think it's a great idea. It's a story that needs to be told. He said, great. So is it a go? And I said, no, nah, it's a no go. Hmm. And I remember there's this death silence on the phone. And he said, well, wait a minute, coach. You think it's a great idea? Oh, it's a fantastic idea. But it's a no go. Yeah, it's a no go. And he said, can you help me understand that? And I said, well, I said, Brad, you got a. It's a great idea, but you got the wrong movie. You got the wrong story. I said, what you have proposed is kind of like a remake of Remember the Titans, where the focus was is on the coach. And I said, you know, I'm the head coach of this team. I, I'm very comfortable in that position. My responsibilities are to teach, to motivate, to correct when necessary, and manage the team. Now, we were a very big team, over 200 players, grades 7 through 12, 15 coaches, six different age grade teams, all of us volunteers, you know, and we practiced every day in the spring. And I said, you want to make the movie about me? And I got to tell you, that's very flattering. But let me tell you what the story is. The story are these young men, ages 13 to 18, grades 7 through 12, who come out and bust it every day in practice. And championships aren't won at the national tournament in May. Championships are won in July and August and December and January before the season ever starts. When your buddies are out eating pizza and going to movies and you're back in the weight room getting ready for the season. I said, you make the story about the players. That is the story. And he said, you know, that's a pretty good idea. They changed <laughs> the whole script. 
and uh, all of the stories and all of the characters are true. There is some Hollywoodization to some of the the uh, stories, but they're based in true facts. And and that's how it came. It opened in theaters coast to coast in 2008. And then it went on to a very successful international run. I appreciate you sharing that story because I think it gives us insight into really what success might mean to you. I mean, I think that what obviously drew them to you was that by, by society's measuring stick for success, you were very successful. You know, you're one of the, the winningest coach in America. But I don't feel like you define, and it doesn't come across in that movie, that you define success the same way that maybe our culture defines it. So could you speak a little bit about how you define success? I think I started out as a coach, uh, loving the sport, and uh, but was very focused on winning. And I think I stayed focused. I mean, you don't win, you don't coach. It's, it's that simple. Uh, but, you know... I saw myself evolving that it became more about the players. And they're at a very influential age, you know, grade seven through 12, ages 13 to 18, trying to help them grow up with their feet on the ground, with their head screwed tight on their shoulders, and hopefully avoiding a lot of the junk of life. Kind of an interesting talk I have with the team uh, again, we're a spring sport. We go, we go into an early training uh, two or three times a week indoors. You know, we're in snow country there in Utah uh, in January and February. Invitation, we call the, the probables and the possibles on the varsity level, you know. But uh, again, we'll have 200 plus players show up in March. We start outdoors the first Monday of March. Then the talk I always have with them goes something like this. I, uh, in terms of human dignity and respect, there is no difference between you and me, the seventh grader and the senior, the varsity captain and the 10th grader, the assistant coach, or any of us. Uh, in terms of human dignity and respect, we're all the same. But there is a big difference between us. And that is our job and responsibility. I can't win without you. You can't win without me. Let's focus on cooperation and a, t and a team focus uh, rather than you know, a competing with each other. When in fact, we do compete for positions, but the focus, and that's taught in a lot of the things that we do is you ask about measuring success. There's something that we say as a team in the locker room right before we go out onto the field. And it's this, it doesn't matter who scores, it only matters that we score. And so I would define success maybe on two parallel tracks. One is obviously the win-loss, the 20 national championships, uh, third place bronze medal in the in the. Uh, World Cup high schools that was held in Africa, uh, where they had the national champions from all the countries come. Nobody gave us a ghost of a chance being Americans. We walked away with a bronze medal, third place world finish, uh, lost in the semifinals to uh, the eventual winner from New Zealand. But I would, so the, that's one definition of success. The other is that may not be exactly applicable. At, all situations, but it's helping these young men grow up, you know, and uh, I believe that my success as a coach will first be measured in the gold medals and the trophies, the wins and losses, but that's really secondary. I think ultimately the best evaluation, the best judge of me as a coach, my success will be measured in 10, 20, 30 years after these boys graduate. What type of men do they become? What type of husbands and fathers, members of the community? What contributions do they make that perhaps we help uh, form that character? That is my definition of success.
I'm curious for you, how did that philosophy evolve? I mean, what are the roots of that approach to coaching, of using sport to grow young men? Where did that come from in your journey? I try to learn from everybody that I come in contact with. I will reflect today and write in my journal what I learned from you and JP in this uh, podcast interview. Uh, and so it's, it's taking all of these lessons from different people and formulating a philosophy of life that hopefully I've passed on to our five children and their spouses and grandchildren now. And hopefully we passed on to players. It was an evolutionary process, Nate. Yeah. And I'm curious if you could maybe unpack a little bit of what the challenges have been like for you in trying to, you know, navigate those two parallel planes of of striving for success on the field and striving for influence in the life of young people, because the majority of our coaches, I think, are on that journey somewhere, are, are motivated by that missional outlook on their purpose in the life of their players. But, you know, as well as I do, it, it's it's harder and harder to coach, it seems, you know, every year, because there's lots of obstacles that coaches face when they start to value the player and have to sometimes make difficult choices, you know, about um, what decisions are going to, you know, stem from that. So what would you say to our coaches that maybe struggle with some of those obstacles, maybe from your own experience in trying to, to do that? I think a couple thoughts come to mind is, um, you know, in relationships, I think that's where you have to establish an identity, which becomes a magnet to draw the people in. And what I have found is there's two philosophies of leadership. And one is horizontal leadership. One is vertical leadership. In short, vertical leadership, think of maybe the coach is up here on top. And if you win, it's great coaching. If you lose, it's, it's lazy, messed up players. A CEO or a department manager, if the company is profitable and doing well, it's the leader. But if the company is struggling, it's, it's, the, um, it's the employees, it's the staff. You see, the basic philosophy of vertical leadership is you are not smart enough, Nate, to do it without me. And so if we succeed, it's really because of me. And if we fail, it's really because of you, because you didn't do what I told you. The focus of vertical leadership is on me, the leader. Well, contrast that with horizontal leadership. And I talked to you about the, the uh, conversation I have with all these players is there's no difference between us except in our responsibility. But in human dignity, that 13-year-old deserves as much human dignity and respect as the captain of the varsity who's an 18-year-old muscled young man. He did, they deserve that. One of the things that we did is had a mentoring program where the older players would mentor the younger players. And this goes a lot to your question is I would say to coaches, you know, don't do it all yourself. Use the team. You know, in high school, <clears throat> the very popular kids are like God on the campus, aren't they? I mean, the big man on campus, everybody wants to be the quarterback or the star rugby player, the star basketball player, the, the SBO, student body officer. Everybody wants to be. A, do, you know, do you have any idea what it means to a little ninth grader who just wants to be accepted? He's, you know, he's kind of in between boyhood and manhood and he's 14 and the star of the school, Bill you know, comes walking down and say, says to Greg, the ninth grade, hey, Greg, um, why don't you come and sit with us at lunch? And Greg and Greg's friends are going, you know, Bill, you know, <laughs> you know, the God of the high school and th things like that uh, just make all the difference. And so our older players mentored younger players and they would say things like, listen, Greg, you know, you don't have to get involved in all this garbage. You don't have to do drugs. You know, you don't have to drink. That is garbage. You know, their peers can say things that carry more influence 
than even their parents or coaches. So I think that coaches can look at developing the character, keeping in mind you're not a Pied Piper and people have their own agency to make their own decisions. Uh, and you, but I, uh, in that development, I think it's critical to involve the other players, those, those key players that make or break the team, they can influence the players in ways that sometimes a coach or parent cannot. It wasn't just you, but it was your players have had a lot of success, a lot of winning. And then in 2008, you had the film come out. And I'm sure all that attention, all that success, that had to probably bring challenges with it. You know, I think it was John Wooden that said ability gets you to the top, but character keeps you there. So you guys obviously had high character, but what were some ways that you personally um, were able to stay grounded through all that attention and success, as well as your team, your players, how did you keep them grounded? I think what helped us more than anything else was the culture that was already embedded in the team with the, Win-loss record we had, we had a target on our back. We were everybody's Super Bowl, you know, and we would talk about that. And uh, we would talk about, you know, it's great to have this win-loss record. It's great to have a movie, but let's live up to the hype now. And the boys took that very seriously. I mean, every team was throwing everything they had at us. And there was no, there were no off days. There was no off games. And the boys understood that. And again, it was a, it was the leadership of the team, not just the captains, but we had other leaders. We'd have a leader over five players to, you know, look out for them on and off the field. Uh, uh, you know, we'd have interdependent act. We did a lot of interdependent activities you know, especially with fun and food. Uh, and, and we would talk about these things. You know, it's like, we don't want these guys saying they beat us. And so I think it was a culture that we had developed. And those relationships are built out of mutual need and desire. And, you know, the, the players would get together for dinner, the varsity, the night before a game. And coaches didn't go to this dinner. They would organize it at one of the players' homes, and the parents would bring dinner. And, you know, the varsity, which was about 30 players, you know, 23 suited, and then uh, some other reserves. I'll tell you, the captains, from what I hear, because I never went to one of these dinners. I kind of missed out on a free meal, you know. <laughs> uh, but uh, the captains and the players, we have what we call a ball toss. And whoever had the ball, this is after the dinner, whoever had the rugby ball got to speak and say whatever was on their mind. You know, it could be a thank you, it could be a challenge, and then somebody could call for the ball or this player could toss and I want to hear from you. And they would do a ball toss the night before a game and talk about what this game meant and how they're going to attack it. Let's unpack a little bit of this leadership within the team? Because you've mentioned this a few times and I think you've got some things there. One thing I'd be curious about is you said each leader was responsible for five different players um, on the team. Could you talk a little bit more about what those sure. respons responsibilities entailed and maybe even how you selected the player captains? We as a coaching staff selected two captains. And then we have others that we just called them team leaders. And it might be five or six players. And what they would do is kind of just, I mean, they're not, they're not going to be mom and dad to them or anything like that. But these are players that have the respect of everybody on the team. And when they speak, the players listen. Their responsibilities would make sure they're in practice that they're not sloughing classes and their, and their attitude, they, you know, they'd get together in groups of five or six and they would talk about 
what they wanted to accomplish on the team and what they wanted to accomplish in life. They talk personal issues with each other in a way that, you know, sometimes they come to me as a coach. I always all often suggested they talk to their parents or their pastor or rabbi about issues. But I talked to a lot of boys about issues that they needed someone outside the family. But these team leaders, they talk to the team leaders about personal issues. You see, when there's a level of trust, they open up like a book and they will talk to each other. They would talk about their behavior on and off the field, including out of season. So what it was, talk about encouragement, uh, invitations to change, and pointing them in the right direction. And it was part of our culture. One of the things about that culture you also mentioned that I'm going to guess helped it establish that trust with some of these interdependent activities you talked about. You guys like to eat. I remember watching a documentary about you after you had retired. And one of the things that players spoke too, was the intentionality on team trips. And you guys, as we talked about before we even started recording this podcast, you guys have traveled all over the world. And how have you used those interdependent activities, those team bonding? I'm like, how did you shape those to create and establish trust within the team culture? Well, you know, one of the things, first of all, all the activities have got to have a purpose and they got to be fun. Um, one of the things that I think the boys understood is what a unique opportunity this was. And we talk a lot about personal example. Um, you know, you don't need to be foul mouth. You're not, uh, you're not out running around on trips or things like that. Uh, but an element both at home and on trips that we included was service. You saw in the movie Forever Strong uh, some service projects. Now, there's more to service than just being good citizens. We would also look for opportunities. When we went to the, the World High School Championship, it, again, it took the, rather than the national team, it took the individual high school champion of all the countries around the world. So you had, you know, Wales. We played Wales. We beat them. Uh, uh, which was a tough game. They couldn't believe it. A bunch of Americans beat them. <laughs> How embarrassing, you know. Tonga, we beat the national champion of Tonga. That was more than they could bear, a bunch of Americans beating them at their home sport. But we, we, we were gone in Africa for almost a month uh, in this uh, World Cup. We incorporated service opportunities, and we do that at home. Now, it's, it, it is much more than just being good citizens. One of the things that service teaches players is unselfishness. You know, we all, have, as coaches, have challenges with selfish players, you know, ball hogs, we call them. Well, you remember what we say before, at every game before we go out on the field? I told you that earlier. It doesn't matter who scores. It only matters that we score. These service opportunities taught unselfishness because we, you go out and you're working in someone's yard or at a hospital or, or whatever. You have no thought of anything in return. And uh, so I think that service is a big part of it. but. Always a focus on fun and food. Uh, you want to get to a boy's heart, go straight to his stomach. Well, Larry, I want to ask you a question about your culture and how that's passed down from generations of players. As you described your leadership um, model there with using captains and using team leaders to mentor and build into the lives of players coming into the program. Um, in the film, you see examples of former players writing letters to current players that are wearing the same jersey. Can you talk a little bit about how connecting those generations has helped to be able to continue to perpetuate that culture year in and year out over a long, a long career? Building the culture goes outside the players and their families. It goes to those who've gone before. Now, what we would do, uh, as portrayed in the movie, 
the writing of letters is something that we did. In rugby, the, the jersey number goes to your position. So if you're at this or that position, the same, you could change your number where in football or basketball, you know, you just keep your number regardless of where you're playing. Um, we'd bring back an alumni. He might be 20 years old. He might be 50 years old. And let's say uh, the uh, center, which is like a fullback, you know, the, the, your key running back is uh, number 13. And we'd have the, Number 13 on the current varsity is probably 17 years old or something. Stand up in front of the team and, and the, the alumni would come and talk to the team, but then we'd pull his number up. He'd say, listen, son, I, I wore that number. I know what it means. I know what it means to be on this team. I know the sacrifices that you make. And, uh, and then with no scripting from me, he would, he would put that player under kind of a covenant. He says, this is what I expect from you on and off the field. And the player, you know, would either make a commitment or not. And then that alumni player, not every day, but, you know, at games would be sure and say hello to him and maybe send him a text message once or twice during the season say, hey, you had a great game, Bill, or something like that. So that was really important, particularly the players like when Haloti Nata, who played for me all four years, all pro, just retired, all pro in the NFL. In high school, he was 6'4", 325 pounds, played second row, the lock position. And he was not a fatty. I mean, he was just muscled. I, I used to say, hello to you, you're a freak of nature in every good sense of the word. Can you imagine high school kids trying to tell him? Well, he was all pro with the Baltimore Ravens. He'd come back to practice because they were out of season in the NFL. And he'd stand before the team and say, let me tell you what's up, guys. And he said, being on, and he actually said this on ESPN. He says, rugby and this team was the best preparation for college and professional football that I that I could possibly have and so you you include them in that and I think that had a great part of it all right we're going to take a break there and we will be back next week with the second part of our conversation where Larry's going to share some strategies like win which stands for what's important now and how he used that to drive the culture and to create an incredible experience for his players. In the meantime, you can learn more about Larry at LarryGelwicks.com. He's done a lot of motivational speaking. I know he just did something there with Major League Baseball and um, their players. Also, if you'd like to implement a similar leadership or count, captain's council system within your team like Larry discussed today, I highly recommend checking out our Captain's Council Coach Tube course. You can get the course and all its resources by going to thriveonchallenge.com and there's links there and you can save 10% by using the coupon code coaching culture. Thank you again for listening to the podcast. Be sure to subscribe and share and we'll be back next week.